Hello, and welcome to episode 359 of the Thinking LSAT podcast. I'm Ben Olson. That's Nathan Fox. Together, we're the co founders of LSATdemon.com and the LSAT Demon Daily podcast. This is going to air on Monday, July 16th, 2022. If you want to get on an upcoming episode, email us today at help at thinkinglsat.com. We will get that email and we will record next week's podcast tomorrow. That is on Tuesday, July 17th. So get on the show. Tell us what you think. We did a mailbag of questions today. What do you think the main takeaway was? If any? you know the one that I the one that sticks out to me the most is that email from Yesenia. Okay. Yeah. Yesenia is somebody who went to college a little bit later in life. She only managed a 2.6 GPA while she was um, wrangling her three kids and uh, working at the same time. She's a survivor of abuse. She wants to go to law school to help people. And she's getting bad advice from the school that she already went to. Yeah. Telling her that she can get an MBA to get her GPA up for law school admissions, which is fictional. 100% false. Okay. (laughs) And she's, she's looking to get a job as one of these nonprofit attorneys who helped her get out of her abusive relationship and file for divorce and everything. And, yeah. you know, she has like the best of intentions, but the the bulk of the middle of the episode today was a kind of a cautionary tale for Yesenia about, hey, you need to be sure that you're going to be able to get one of these jobs and you really need to go to a law school that's not going to charge you tuition because, you know, you're you want to you want to help people. Well, you need to help yourself first yep. uh, by stopping because she says she's already neck deep in debt from her undergraduate degree. And it's just terrifying. So we gave Yesenia all kinds of advice, hopefully in how to avoid uh, making that, you know, (laughs) she's in a hole and we definitely want her to stop digging. Agreed. Totally. We also had a nice email from Matt Dumont, uh, a demon teacher here and friend and long time. Yeah. Just a killer friend. Yeah. And, and pal of ours. And, uh, great teacher for the demon and hopefully he will always continue to teach for the demon. But yeah, he's announcing his job that he has arranged uh, more than a full year before even graduating from university of Maryland. So yeah, unbelievable. Good job, Matt. Yeah. The uh, registration deadline for the September, 2022 LSAT is Tuesday, July 26th. So you have 10 days um, to make that decision. You can find all the LSAT dates at lsat.link forward slash dates. Nathan is offering a free class on Thursday, July 28th. Do law school rankings matter? Um, If you've listened to this podcast enough, hopefully you know the answer to that question, but Nathan will dig into the details of the 100% rule, the estimator, and so on. That's going to be Thursday at 4 p.m. Pacific, 7 p.m. Eastern, July 28th. You can yep. sign up for that at lsat.link forward slash Nathan. Do you want to say anything else about that? Yeah, all you need is a demon free account. And there's tons of good resources there with a demon free account anyway. I mean, I, I think it's the best free self-study tool that exists. Um, so get yourself one of those because you should start using the free resources that we offer, including get invited to all of these free classes that I teach uh, every other Thursday for now. Uh, are we still soliciting for new teachers? We're always soliciting for new teachers. Um, folks keep going off. <laughs> Our teaching core keeps leaving us for Harvard Yale. and <laughs> Yale. Yeah. So uh, we we need new. Um, we always need new teachers. We we want really though. We want demon students and listeners. Like if you drank the Kool Aid and you know you drank the Kool Aid. And you scored 170 something on an official LSAT. Yep. I want to hear from you. I'm Nathan at LSATdemon.com. We want your score report. A screenshot's fine, by the way. You don't need to spend 50 bucks to get an LSAC official report. Screenshot of your score report and um, a video of you teaching a game or you teaching a logical reasoning question. I need to see your face and see, I need you to be explaining a question, um, talking it through the way I do in class, the way Ben does in class, just like, you know, show us that you understand the demon way. And, uh, 
yeah, come teach for us. It's a great gig. On to the show. All right. This first one is from Anonymous. Got it? Yeah. Says, hi, Ben and Nathan. I'd love your advice on how to deal with test day anxiety. I'm an international student and currently enrolled in law school in the Netherlands with one more year left before I graduate. I've been studying with the demon for quite a while now. Apart from that, I'm doing my best to immerse myself in the English language by listening to podcasts, reading books, and taking English taught electives in law school. I could see that this paid off. I came from a 148 diagnostic score and saw my scores increase to the mid 160s on practice tests. The estimator indicated that I would be able to get a full ride at several schools I'm interested in with a score in this range. Uh, That's our scholarship estimator, by the way, lsatdemon.com forward slash scholarships. This made me feel confident and ready to take the June LSAT. Unfortunately, my official test did not go as expected, and I was disappointed to find out that I scored a 155 on my official test. I don't want to blame it all on nerves, but I feel like that did affect my score. I ran out of time on my first section reading comp, which made me feel anxious during the entire test. I couldn't get back to my senses during the intermission and found myself just staring at the screen for the remaining part of the test without actually understanding what it said. Yikes. I felt like I couldn't even understand English anymore. I don't understand how this could have happened. I deal with stress regularly in law school uh, in the Netherlands and have never experienced my brain shutting off like this. Is there anything I can do to prevent this from happening again when I retake the test? I know you guys always talk about not giving the test too much power and treating it like any other practice test, but what are some actions I can undertake to actually achieve this? I will keep studying with the demon and retake the test whenever I'm ready. Mm. I think therein lies the problem. Hopefully your advice will help me to do better next time. I want to hear your tips, uh, Ben, for anxiety, but or and your response to Anonymous specifically. But I want to start with the last thing they said. I will keep studying with the demon and retake the test whenever I'm ready. The one thing I wanted to say about that was that to me sounds like an acknowledgement that you weren't ready the first time. Mm. You were mid 160s, you say, on your practice tests. You collapsed to a 155 on your official test. The problem with taking it when you're in the mid 160s is that your game is just not that good, right? I mean, like that, that's the thing I think that, I don't know. That's at least the first thing I think we should say Mm. is, you know, it's easy to not be anxious when you're, when you're actually good at it. Okay. Yeah. And I mean, mid one sixties, right? So what does that mean? Practice test scores are, are going anywhere from like the low one sixties to upper one sixties. And So 155, you know, how much of that is this anxiety, which clearly happened, but how much of this is just also a variance? So (laughs) yeah, if you get better at the test, these drops, if they do occur, are going to be not as significant. Well, it's just the test is difficult and taxing and stressful to the extent that you don't really understand it. Mm -hmm. And when you're at 165, let's say, You've improved a lot. You're understanding more than you used to, but you're not understanding all of it. There's a lot you're not understanding. Mm -hmm. And Mm -hmm. as you noted, Ben, your scores are naturally, if you're averaging 165, you're going to fluctuate from, you know, 161 to 169, let's say. Mm -hmm. That 161 especially is like, well, yeah, you don't understand healthy chunk of the test. You do understand a healthy chunk of it, but there's another healthy chunk of it that you don't understand. And then especially if you draw 
some of those questions first. Which is, I think, what happened to Anonymous on this reading comp section, right? It's mm-hmm. like you had a tough section right off the bat, which you're more inclined to have tough sections because you're just not that great at the test. You're good, but not great. Then you have a tough section and then it's real tough. I mean, we might have some tips for how to compartmentalize that and move on and still do OK on the other sections. But I mean, it's like the first problem is you had that problem on that first section. And maybe you could get better at the test before you take your official next attempt. And just be good enough at it that you're less likely to be susceptible to running into something that is going to cause you problems. The last thing I want to say before I forget about it is that Anonymous is worried that they ran out of time on their first section, which was reading comp. But you're presumably, yeah, English is not your first language. There's no way you're going to finish the reading comprehension section on time. You shouldn't be trying to finish the reading comprehension section on time. You should be shooting for three perfect passages, maybe. I mean, two perfect passages if if that if you can't do three. But like it's you need perfect passages. You need to feel good about your answers. You should not be trying to finish the section. You're freaking out about the wrong thing. I mean, running out of time. Well, that's what should happen if you're reading it carefully. And you know, unless you're accommodated or something and you have all the time in the world, I, I don't know. All right. Sorry. Go ahead, Ben. I'm sure you no. have tips for Anonymous. No, recap. So focus on getting better at the test, right? That means doing a question, reviewing that question, drilling a question, reviewing that question, and understanding that as best you possibly can. To the extent you can do that, you're going to, as you've already been doing because you're studying with the demon, but to the extent you can do that, you're going to improve your understanding of the test and that's going to itself make you more confident and better at the test, right? Which will reduce the likelihood that you have anxiety in the future. That's what you're saying. That is definitely the first thing that I'm saying. Yeah. And then with the reading comprehension part, I'm saying you're freaking out about the wrong thing. Yeah. It's, it's, surprising to hear anonymous say that because it sounds like anonymous is pretty familiar with our approach and our way um and so i we've pointed it out before but just to make it really clear here there are lots of people who score in the high 170s and don't finish you're scoring in the mid 150s to mid 160s you should not be finishing if you are finishing either you're doing very well in that section great or you're doing something wrong. You had Carl Lasker on the daily podcast just recently. Yep. And um, Carl is at Yale Law School, very successful applicant and LSAT teacher for us. And Carl did not finish his reading comprehension section on his official LSAT. He scored a 179, but he didn't finish his reading comp because he couldn't because he was taking the time to make sure that he was solving all of the previous questions accurately, which he did. (laughs) So you're not, you're like not even a native English speaker. You're like bouncing around the mid one sixties and you're worried that you didn't finish the reading comp. Well, Carl wasn't worried that he didn't finish the reading comp. Yeah. So step one, (laughs) study more. Step two, don't try to finish the reading comp section and probably the other sections for now um, will never try to finish. It will just happen naturally. Three, um, when people are anxious, it is because they're focusing on the wrong things. Right here, uh, Anonymous was focusing on not finishing the reading comp section and how it didn't go as well as he or she would have wished it did. But that is not your job at any given moment in the test. Your job is to do the question or the sentence really that you're reading right then. And so when you're anxious, it's because a part of your mind is thinking about something else. Oh, I'm not gonna finish. Oh, I didn't finish. Oh, um, that game was harder than I had wanted. I had hoped that the first game would be easier. Um, The proctor is asking me more questions than I had wanted. You're focusing on the wrong thing, but 
If you can get yourself to come back to focusing on the sentence or the question you're working on right now, that anxiety will start to subside and it's your best chance at doing well on the test, right? You even said my brain shut down. Well, that's, that's unfortunate. But then even at that moment, you're thinking about your brain and how you're not thinking as opposed to just take a deep breath and focus on the next few words on the page. This test is a written test and it's about reading and understanding the words that were given to you. Now, when you get distracted, and when you think about, hey, I didn't finish that section, or I'm not going to finish as much as I'd like to finish, or whatever it is, that's okay. That happens all the time. This isn't about, oh, I can't have those thoughts, and I'm failing if I do. It's when you have them, you want to train yourself to refocus on what you're doing. And that's the skill you want to develop the skill of letting go of whatever you're thinking about and coming back to the sentence that you're on. And that may be multiple times a test and that's okay. If you yeah. can do that, you'll win. Meditation could help a lot. Uh, one thing that is sort of surprising for people who are new in meditation, it's we're not trying not to have thoughts. Mm -hmm. We're trying to let go of those thoughts when they inevitably arrive. Yep. Like clouds passing over in the sky and you observe that thought and you notice that thought and you go, okay, goodbye thought. Mm -hmm. And you return to your breath or your seat or your feet on the ground or whatever grounding types of tricks you might have developed in a meditation practice. Yep. You take a deep breath and you go back to the task at hand, which is the one question, you know, the one sentence that you're supposed to be reading right now. Yeah. And then inevitably that little voice, you know, little anxiety thing is going to start chattering away again. And you don't you don't prevent it. You don't push it away. You just let it pass through you. Thanks for writing in and good luck. Yeah. Thanks, Anonymous. All right, here's a, uh, this is kind of a silly, fun one from uh, Demon Teacher Becca. She posted this on our uh, Teacher Slack channel. Becca wrote, how do I submit an Instagram post of a tweet for the podcast? Okay, so we have a tweet that was then put on Instagram, and now she's grabbing <laughs> it and throwing it in Slack. And then and we put it in Google it. Docs. <laughs> yeah. And now we're putting it on a podcast. Maybe eventually it'll make it back to Twitter. Well, this guy got a lot of traction that he probably didn't realize. I think this is a, a perfect example of, quote, no one thinks you're cool for using big words, close quote. Yeah, so a lot of law students who end up going to law school, they read a lot of big words in law cases and they start using them and they use it as a way to right, put themselves into the role of an attorney. But... <laughs> Unfortunately, it kind of has the opposite of the intended effect. And so we have a, a tweet from Justin Wales, who is the head of legal for North America at crypto.com. Anyways, Justin writes, I can tell it is summer associate season in big law because all of the memos I'm receiving from outside counsel are three times the length and have the word, quote, <laughs> aforementioned in them at least twice. <laughs> yeah, those are two really bad signs that you're dealing with young writers, right? So the big law firms are like, they're getting all their summer associates, they're assigning them jobs that they're then sending <laughs> to these firms, their clients. And aforementioned, man, people do use that a lot and it is stupid. Uh, yeah, a worse sin than that is making it three times as long as it that would is typically bad. be. <laughs> well, it's, it's actually partly three times as long because they're using words like aforementioned and not just <laughs> yeah. saying like the shit that they need to say. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Good writing is a product of good editing mm -hmm. more than anything else. And uh, we yeah, you, you need to take the time to edit it it's a sign of respect to your reader when you take the time to reread it boil it down keep it 
tight <laughs> so that you can get in and get out and uh, not waste their day. This uh, tweet itself was edited. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Interesting. Wow. Okay, cool. Thank you, Becca, for submitting that for the show. This is an email it came in through our website. This is from Jared. Hi, Ben and Nathan. You know, people do this all the time in emails, Ben. And I, sorry, Jared, you're the one whose balls are getting busted for this. But um, why do people put my name is Jared at the beginning of their email when their email is clearly coming from a person named Jared? I don't know. Maybe they're really in the like the the verbal <laughs> or oral. Sorry, the oral like mindset. Even right? that. My Do you ever go in and go like, my name is Ben and I would like to see about getting new tires for my car <laughs> here today <laughs> at Costco? I mean, I don't know that <laughs> it's like, it's just so funny. It's a, but it's like, I don't know, man. It's like not, maybe not half, but close to the emails that come in have that my name is at the beginning at the in hmm. the very first sentence my it's interesting name is. yeah it almost it's interesting. Like a song oh. okay um <laughs> i didn't know you were an eminem fan okay um hi ben and nathan my name is jared i'm a longtime listener and recent demon basic subscriber cool welcome jared my scores have increased dramatically since using your services Fantastic. They will continue, I believe, to increase dramatically. I have been struggling recently on deciding if I should attend law school this upcoming cycle or <laughs> I don't even need to know what comes after the or. Do you? <laughs> it's like the answer is always yes. Yes. It's like, yes. Do that. <laughs> you, you have another idea? Really? OK, great. Do that first. Do that first. It, it is. It, it's probably better. It's definitely cheaper. It is um, something that you probably can't do once you get on the, you know, endless hamster wheel uh, of law. Yep. It's something you'll probably always worry about, always think about. You'll probably mm -hmm. always be thinking about this other thing, not even knowing mm -hmm. what this other thing is. Yeah. If you're not sure, why don't you go try the other thing first? <laughs> you know, before you become, what was it? Unhappy, unethical, something and unethical, unhealthy, unhappy, unhealthy and unethical. As a um, former law professor and judge <laughs> wrote in mm -hmm. an actual law review article that we discussed on a recent episode of the show, um, you know, the the field is like it's scary, man. I know a lot of lawyers and it's just a scary life. It's a perfect fit for some people. It is very not perfect for, I think, most people. The rest and, of the world. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and so unless you're really one of those kind of sickos um, who is going to be perfectly happy and successful as a lawyer, uh. You should have some idea, I think, that you like, are you a sicko? Do you understand who, how you are? Do you do you get it? Do you know that you're that guy that I'm talking yeah. about yeah. or gal that I'm talking about? Do you understand? Do you, some of my best friends, by the way, but it's a special kind of kind of psychopath kind of. Mm -hmm. And if that's you, then, yeah, OK, full steam ahead to law school. But. If it's not you, then I don't know, like if you've got any other idea. Probably you kind of prefer that. Mm -hmm. Anyway, Jared continues. I want to wait a year or two to pursue a possible career in music. Sounds fun. Do it. Sounds very fun. Sounds very rewarding. Your colleagues will be infinitely more interesting. <laughs> Your office will be wildly a better place. Sounds potentially healthy, ethical, and um, happy. Happy. <laughs> yeah. My scores are not up to par quite yet. 162 on my best practice test. And I may need to take a year off either way to get where I need to be. 
I do not have a lot of money saved either for the upcoming year if I do attend. I really love the idea of being a professional student as an attorney, which we've discussed on the show before. Many lawyers describe themselves as professional students. Their job isn't to know things. Their job is to learn things on behalf of their client. Yeah. But I would love your input as to when a gap year or two gap years is a good idea, especially when I have another passion in music that I have been offered some opportunities to pursue in Nashville. In Nashville, of all places. Which is one of the coolest places in the world and just like the capital of the music business. Yeah. Hmm. And like you've, (laughs) hey, if nothing else, the next couple of years, Jared, will be something that you'll remember for the rest of your life. If you make it, you make it. And thank God, never pursue. <laughs> it's like this is two just the exact opposite ends of the spectrum. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's it's also just a win win. If you take this time off, you have the opportunity to improve your LSAT score to the best possible it could be, which is what you need to do to go to law and really get the best or the most out of this career at the same time you can now pursue music which you may end up doing so i i don't see any other option here it's not an either or it's it's go do this and if you want to keep working on the lsat go for it 100 percent. yeah i'm glad we could easily solve jared's problem go go all in on this music thing i mean and if that means you can't study for the LSAT, that's OK, too. Mm-hmm. But you could probably chip away an hour a day at the LSAT while you pursue your dreams in music. You're going to have a blast in Nashville. It's you're going to have the time of your life one way or the other. And then law school will always it's like it's always there. It never changes. There's There's no like a gap year or two gap years or five gap years or 10 gap years. I don't care. They're still taking applications. (laughs) They're still going to be here peddling, you know, wildly overpriced JDs that only like half of the people who get them ever use. Mm -hmm. And uh, you want the right LSAT, which, you know, 170 something, if you can get there so that you can at least not pay for that JD. You'll still have to pay in terms of time and, you know, anguish. Um, But you won't at least have to pay tuition if you finally get that 172. And I don't care. Yeah, it takes five, 10 years to get there. It's it's just, (laughs) they'll be there exactly the same. Yeah. Thanks for writing in, Jared. Okay. You want to do this one from Yesenia? Yes, Enya, thank you. Hi, Ben and Nathan. I'm 34 years old and just finished my undergraduate degree. My GPA is below a 3.0, about 2.6 to be exact. I have a career in tech and want to change gears and become a nonprofit family law attorney. <sighs> Why? Why? Why do you want to become a nonprofit? family law attorney. Well, she's about to explain it to you. A little background on on why I want to make the switch. A few few years ago, I was getting out out of an abusive relationship. I needed help with a proactive protective order and filing for divorce. I did not have a lot of money, really no money. I tried going the legal aid route and was not very successful. I eventually found some awesome nonprofit attorneys that were able to help me for little to no cost. As an abuse survivor, I know many of us do not have the financial means to hire an attorney to help us through the court process. Also, my experience with family law attorneys proved that they were more concerned with the financial gains over helping a victim of abuse. That's not the nonprofit attorneys that she's so happy about. That's the The, actual uh, struggling lawyers who are trying to make a living doing family law. Got it which I understand after all is it is a business and they were for-profit attorneys. Okay. My experience led me to go back to school to get my BA to be able to apply to law school. As I have been researching and trying to educate myself on what to do next, I came across your podcast and have learned a lot from you both. 
I am already neck deep in debt for my undergraduate degree, and I know law school will be even more expensive. I have not taken the LSAT, so I do not know what my baseline is. My questions for you both are, will my GPA automatically disqualify me from any law school? Well, Yesenia, you need to go to lsatdemon.com forward slash scholarships. I'm going to do that right now on your behalf. I mean, the short answer is no. I went to law school with a 2.5 undergraduate GPA. Yeah. But the longer answer is I shouldn't have gone to law school at all. And I certainly shouldn't have gone to law school and paid for it. That was a tragic mistake. Yeah. At lsatdemon.com forward slash scholarships, I'm putting in a 3.6 under your GPA. 2.6. Um, Sorry, I'm putting in a 2.6 under your GPA. I'm putting in a, let's say, the average LSAT score, which is like 152. Okay. And then I'm going to hit the URM box um, just based on Yesenia's first and last name. I have a feeling that she might be ticking boxes. So I'm going to tick that box and I'm going to see what it comes up with. Unlikely to get scholarships pretty much anywhere until you start to get around the schools ranked like 100th in the country, which are whatever. It's fine. It's just regional law schools like Louisiana State University, Baton Rouge, uh, you know, but they're going to give you a scammership. They're going to give you less than half mm -hmm. uh, Washburn University, wherever the hell that is. Drake University, wherever the hell that is. Uh, I guess I should know where Drake is. Do you know where Drake is? No, but Golden Gate is saying full tuition. Oh, Golden Gate, full tuition. Wow, they're really struggling at Golden Gate these days. <laughs> really, Golden Gate? 2.6 on a 152? That's a full ride? I put 2.6, 152, URM, and then I sorted by actual cost. Well, their 50th percentile LSAT is 151. Hmm. Um... <laughs> Say that again, Ben. What did you do? You put 2.6, 152, and then you sorted by actual cost, which is at the very yeah. top of the page. Yep. Um, you might need to expand your browser. Yeah, you do probably need to expand your browser to see that uh, that feature. But you can sort by actual cost and then, yeah, so you can see where those scholarships. So, yeah, and the other one is a Southern University Law Center, Yesenia. The, the point is this. That 2.6 is definitely not going to automatically disqualify you from law school. The thing we're worried about is that it's going to qualify you to waste a ton of money on law school. You absolutely cannot pay given your debt already. Yeah, I mean, because the first thing that I want to tell you, Yesenia, is that you got to talk to these lawyers like you should try to reach back out to your actual nonprofit lawyers, if you can get a hold of them and say, hey, here's my plan. Is this feasible at all? Mm -hmm. Where did you go to law school? You should ask them where they went to law school. You should ask them how hard it is to get their job because Yesenia, nonprofit money comes from somewhere. So this nonprofit hires attorneys based on donations that came in from wherever. And those jobs tend to be like really competitive a lot of times because there's many, many, many more wannabe do-gooders than there are um, nonprofit dollars to pay for the do-gooding. Yeah. And so you, you know, like you need, it's not just get a law degree and then automatically become a nonprofit family law attorney because you need somebody who's going to pay you to do that job. So find out. And we don't know what well, you're asking the wrong people how we don't know how hard it is to find that job. But you should ask to the people that, you know, who actually have that job and then figure out like, hey, you know, what kind of school do I need to go to? What is the, how how do I get exactly your not? I don't want to take your job from you. How do I get a job at your law office? Yeah. How does this work? How does chances? this work? Yeah, because you're and I'm I'm so glad that you're writing us, Yesenia, because there's you there's a lot 
more here actually that you don't understand um because the next question should i go back for an mba to get my gpa up my current school recommended this as an option your pre-law advisor should be fired yesenia because you cannot get your gpa up by going and paying wasting money on a graduate degree yeah this is bad and it's self-serving if the school is hoping they'll come back to their mba program <laughs> right some sleazy school like oh well you know i don't know about law school but oh yeah your gpa is low oh well maybe you should pay us for an overpriced mba <laughs> we've already soaked the uh student loan system for your undergraduate degree, you know, if this is the same school that already put you neck deep in debt for your bachelor's and now they're like, oh, you didn't do well in your bachelor's, huh? Well, you could try again with a master's. Jeez Louise. It's sleazy. It's like no man. regards to cost, right? Like, no, because <laughs> it's fake money to them. It's just the they know that the U.S. Department of Education, you know, is just stamping checks or yeah. certifying loans for whatever lent sleazy lenders are stamping the checks, but it's just a student loan bomb that <laughs> is a real big problem. Yeah. And we just don't want that bomb to go off in your face. Yes. And yeah, but law schools only care about your undergraduate GPA. So, no, you cannot get a better MBA. No one cares about your grades in your master's program, not when you're applying to law school. She then continues, the school I want to apply to is the University of Houston Law Center. They offer a part-time program that would work for me as I am a single mother of three and will need to keep a job. So, okay. University of Houston is ranked 61st in the country. Um, man. I'm not sure if a 170 is going to get it done here, Yesenia. Uh, brings it up to more than half. Okay. All right. So that gets you in the conversation. Um, their part-time program. I'm looking now. I Yesenia, if you go to lsatdemon.com forward slash scholarships, if you find University of Houston on that list, there's a little PDF icon that's out to the far right. If you click that little PDF icon, it'll take you directly to the University of Houston's 2021 Standard 509 Information Report. This is an ABA mandate, uh, American Bar Association mandated consumer protection disclosure. And you can see the various LSAT and GPA ranges for their full time and part time programs. Yeah. If you scroll down further, you can see whether they give scholarships for the full-time and part-time programs. Seems like they give fewer scholarships, unfortunately, for the part-time program. Yep. The numbers, though, at the part-time program are slightly less competitive. Mm -hmm. So it might be easier to get into that part-time program. Might be a little bit harder, though, to get a scholarship at that part-time program. <sighs> oh, man. What are we looking at here for... Yesenia, total cost of attendance. Yeah. Anywhere if she gets a 170. 170, it it could be up to $25,000. Per year for year. four years. Yeah. $100, so just tack another, another 100 grand plus interest onto the amount that you already owe so that you can work in nonprofit. Is there like a way, can you go work for these nonprofits and then they turn around and help pay for some of your law school? That's, is there that would be a great plan if it's possible. Or some other firm. Oh, man. Yeah. What are you doing as a part-time? I know you're working full-time. What, what are, what are you doing for your current job? Could you transition into, you know, maybe there's ways that you can start helping the people that you want to help without a JD. Yeah, get in that way. Become a paralegal, legal secretary. Get somebody inside that firm who's really going to champion for you. Yeah. See if you can get them to help you fund this endeavor so that you'll be sure that you're going to actually become the lawyer that you want to be on the other side. Because the law schools don't, man. If you just go like I'm so scared for Yesenia. 
if she just goes and enrolls, like, let's say she got in, you know, like, what are the odds of Yesenia actually doing the work she wants to do if she does get into University of Houston Law Center? We don't know. Yeah. Well, I, I mean, just like snap judgment, if you had to guess. N- minimal. <laughs> yeah, it's like less than 50 percent. For sure. Yeah. I mean, this is an OK law school. It's, well, it's fine a very in narrow Houston. specific area that she's looking for. She really needs to talk to the attorneys, like you said, figure out how they did it figure out whether she even has to go to Houston because there's another school, Texas Southern University. I don't know where that is and if it's accessible to her, but they'll take, they'll give her a full ride with a 164. Do they have part-time? Um, do they have part-time? That's a very important question. Ah, shit. They don't. So, but anyways, I don't know. I'm, I'm nervous. I'm real nervous. Yeah. You know, we're not, we're not telling you not to do this, Yesenia, but we're telling you that the, the next step is certainly to talk to actual lawyers practicing in this field and try to get a credible path to this job. Maybe it's easier than I think. Maybe they're like, Oh, I went to university of Houston law center. Yeah. I, that's where we get everybody right in the middle of my class there. And they have a pipeline directly to my job. I mean, you know, that's that could be the answer. I, but even I then, I kind of doubt it, though. Even then, you're taking on a hundred thousand dollars in extra debt. <sighs> maybe, like you said, maybe there's another path into this field that doesn't require a JD. You got to put the oxygen mask on yourself before you can assist others, and. Yep. Yeah, this is like Yesenia is just taking the oxygen mask down and looking to put it on somebody else, you know, not realizing that she's <laughs> about to asphyxiate. Yeah. Well, and keep in mind that $100,000 extra at the University of Houston is <laughs> still with a 170. You start going below 170, we're not. We're not looking at as much scholarship money, so. It's a lifetime of debt. I mean, I suppose if you actually got this nonprofit job, then you would qualify for tuition forgiveness 10 years from now. If you make 120 (laughs) qualifying payments under an income-based repayment (sighs) plan. I just hate those kind. I I, I hate the idea that that even exists because that idea gives people the excuse to like pursue that path when it's not a viable one. It's all part of the scam. Yeah, It's all part of keeping the the dollars flowing for as long as they can. Oh, we'll give you the money. We'll forgive you that loan. Oh, I can get forgiven of that loan. It's like, you know, when you get like people get leases on cars and they don't realize all the catches that come along with it. Like they have this like notion that, Oh, it's going to be easy. <laughs> yeah. It's oh, so the loan's forgivable. Oh, so so the loan will be forgiven. Oh, yeah, okay, no problem. <laughs> but then it's like, okay, now sign here and sign here and sign yep. here. Wait, what? I why am I signing all this if the loan's forgivable? <laughs> well, I don't know. Read all those documents and read how you're going to have to work in a nonprofit, you know, can't make too much money, can't marry somebody who makes too much money, have to make 120 qualifying payments, monthly payments, 120 monthly payments. <laughs> and then if the program still exists, you might get your loan forgiven. And they're not mired in backlogs and corruption that <laughs> or fails they don't, to deliver As we heard on recently on a podcast, switch lenders seven times, you know, your loan gets bought and then your loan gets bought again and then your loan gets bought again. And there's no record. And then there's no record of your qualifying payments. So you can't qualify for the. <sighs> <laughs> it's just like, don't borrow the money in the first place. Stop borrowing money for school. It's yep. not worth it. Work your way through school, pay tuition if you have the money. But like this green light for student debt idea is um just not that's just a really dangerous scary myth 
Yesenia says, um, any recommendations on scholarships to look into? Go to the scholarship estimator as Nathan directed you to earlier and consider moving. It might be cheaper for you to move somewhere else where the cost of living is lower <laughs> and you can go to law school for free. I realize it's hard. You're a single mother of three and maybe you have family nearby, but maybe you have family somewhere else and actually moving could save you money, could get you into a school for 100%. Yep. Consider scholarship. it if yep. it's possible. Um, I want to make sure Yesenia is aware that the scholarships that we care about are the scholarships that are given by the schools themselves and no other scholarships. The schools love to try to distract you away from the real money. You know, they hold up the shiny quarter mm -hmm. of these outside scholarships. Oh, there's all kinds of scholarship. We have a whole binder full of scholarships in the um, in the financial aid office. And uh, yeah, once you're enrolled, then you can go to the financial aid office and you can look through that binder and you can apply for scholarships that, you know, there's yeah, there's a lot of good scholarships that you can apply to from outside sources. Meanwhile, the real game that's being played is totally available for public consumption on the bottom of this school's 509 report. I mean, the truth is I'm looking now at one I've never looked at before. University of Houston Law Center. They give 66% of their incoming students some form of scholarship help. Most of those are scammerships. 46% of the students are getting less than half tuition. Those are not good offers. Those are, you know, oh, we're going to charge you $45,000 a year, but we're going to give you $7,500 scholarship. But, but even notice that that $7,500 scholarship is more than most of these like outside scholarships that you have to go oh, apply yeah, for. Right. They're like $2,500. That's for more than like anything <laughs> in that binder probably. Right. Yeah. It, you know, but then another 18% are getting somewhere between half and full tuition. And there are a few lucky people, seven people getting a full tuition scholarship, another seven people somehow getting more than full. That might be because they do have some of those outside scholarships in addition to the full scholarship from the school. But you just don't want to be the person who's getting a less than half tuition scholarship or no scholarship at all funding all of these people. Absolutely. To talk about your shiny quarter, just yesterday I was listening to a podcast about undergraduate financing. Now, this is not law school financing, but they were talking about these outside scholarships. They account for 4% of college financing. Outside scholarships do. Yeah. But they're yeah. they're talked about all the time. That's what oh, everybody talks about. It's forty look at these yeah. or four hundred percent of what the law school or the schools themselves want to talk about. Yeah. They're it's always not their gonna money. <laughs> try to distract you to the like, oh, well, the rotary in your hometown, they have a five hundred dollar essay competition. <laughs> you know, it's like a hundred kids write an essay to apply and one of them gets five hundred bucks. And meanwhile, the school is like, well, we do give full rides for people who have the right LSAT and the right or the right SAT and the right GPA. Yeah. Yep. Um, it's a it, it's bad, man. It's uh, yeah, scary how much debt people are accumulating. I hope that does not happen to you, Yesenia. Thank you very much for. Hey, write back, Yesenia. Help at thinkinglsat.com. If you want to ask us any follow ups, we will put you at the top of our agenda. Because you are exactly the person who we want to save from the terror of law school debt. Absolutely. You Thank just you. can't afford to do it, Yesenia. <laughs> just don't do it. Yeah. Go for free if you can go for free. But uh, first talk to those attorneys and see if this job, you know, path is even a, is even feasible. Yep. Let's see. It's me. It is. Okay. So this is coming from Sorsha says, uh, I'm a recent podcast listener making my way through the back catalog. Today, I listened to episode 333, and I have some insight on the topics covered. You discussed the possibility of becoming a part-time lawyer. You mentioned that neither of you knew much about it and were dubious about the, exis the existence of this career track. In a larger sense, you're probably right, but I wanted to share an experience I had working as an office manager 
at a plaintiff side employment law firm. Okay, excellent. Can one be dubious? Or is something dubious? <laughs> no, no. First, uh, yeah, first definition of dubious is hesitating or doubting. Alex looked dubious, but complied. Synonyms are doubtful, uncertain, unsure. So she's saying you were doubtful, you were uncertain, you were unsure. Yeah, okay. In a larger sense, you're probably right. Okay, so, the, oh, and uh, Sorsha wants to share this experience. Got it. Mm -hmm. The firm was tiny. Two attorneys, negligible overhead. They employed one law student and me. We were located in San Francisco. The attorneys worked around 20 hours a week. And the year I worked there, they took home $500,000 each. Their business model involved risk and variance. But owning your own practice seems to be the way to go if you want this kind of work-life balance. They were pretty young, I'm guessing early 40s, and had worked at a different employment firm before going out on their own. They both went to bottom feeder law schools, but were clearly very intelligent and had figured out how to work the system. They very likely went to those bottom feeder schools on scholarships. Um, bottom feeder, that's not very nice. But then again, what is Golden Gate? If they're not a bottom feeder, I, I mean, mean, those numbers are so ridiculously low. Well, when they're giving out scammerships too, I mean, I'm not when they're admitting people use... with a 148 and a 2.8 undergraduate GPA and they're offering them, you know, um, here's $15,000 off of our tuition of uh, <laughs> $60,000. Yeah, that's bottom feeding. Yeah. Uh, not to say that you shouldn't go there. You just <laughs> should only go there for free. Just understand <laughs> Yeah, what you're doing. Yep. Yeah. In the episode, you mentioned the work Venn diagram, whether you make money, whether you're good at your job, whether you love it. I'd posit an additional sphere, whether your work aligns with your values. I mean, I think that's part of whether you love it, but maybe not. <laughs> yeah, you love it, but it's like grading at your <laughs> conscious. Well, <laughs> if you're like one of those psychopaths that I was talking about earlier, you know, it's like you, they, they like you can they can like compartmentalize, you know, where they are just like perfectly happy being unethical on their client's behalf or perfectly ha happy being a baller lawyer for a sleaze bag of a client. It seems to align with their values, right? Cause then their value system is win. Money. Yep. Yeah. Win. Make I money. win. You tell me what to do. I'll do it for you. And I'm going to do it the best damn way possible. Yeah. Sorsha says these lawyers were getting to stick it to big corporations committing wage theft and egregious discrimination. They didn't charge their clients anything and only took home a profit if they won a settlement. I'm sure making fuck you money while helping the world is a rarity, but I find it comforting to know the possibility exists. All the best, Sorsha. Um, uh, yeah. Do Go you ahead. think these attorneys were helping the world? Um, I think that in the cases where they actually won, I think that they probably were. Yeah, I think that they probably were. I, I, I think that many lawyers like this are out there, um, you know, especially if they're charging the clients to file the suits. Stirring up agitation where maybe other solutions are more effective or fair. Yeah. I mean, notice that they, they are making ridiculous money working not a lot. Mm -hmm. And, uh, it, it's, it's like, uh, yeah. Are you, Yeah. <laughs> normally you don't get paid that much for not really working. Um, <laughs> if you're, yeah, I, I don't know. I don't know. I mean, we have to take Sorsha at her word. They're sticking it to big corporations committing wage theft and egregious discrimination. Okay. If they are indeed doing that, then 
that seems like, yeah, it aligns with their values. I, I think we should talk about the the idea of owning your own firm. I think it's a fantastic idea. It's a fantastic idea if you have a sense of what it takes to get clients. Yeah. You, yeah. And you you have to be willing to do it, right? Like Ben and I both are, we're not afraid to be entrepreneurs. We We were both okay just going, yeah, I know that if I don't fill my classes, I am not going to be able to pay my rent. Mm-hmm. Ben and I both made that decision. Ben made the decision when he had a family. <laughs> I mean, I made the decision as a, you know, just single knucklehead. And it was, but, but I'm, I'm comfortable knowing that like, yeah, if all the demon subscribers go away, I don't have an income. Yep. So I better be good at what I do. I better continue to deliver value to my students. I better continue to hustle and try to get new students. Um, <laughs> that's why Ben and I, Ben and I showed up for 359 episodes of this podcast <laughs> <laughs> as of today. <laughs> you know, it's like we're willing to continue to grind to to get the the business. But then, yeah, once you're the owner of the business, you do get overcompensated for the successes of the business yeah. instead of working for somebody else uh, where they are going to take all the profits. I mean, profit is a hell of a lot better than a salary. Mm-hmm. In most <laughs> cases. I mean, there are some people who really like, you know, move the system, but that's unusual. It's it's just normally I mean, you know, everybody's reading about these days, especially we're talking about um uh, the discrepancy between the, uh, you know, the ownership class and the working for those owners class. Mm-hmm. And it's, it's true. Like owners are going to make like 10 X what the employees are making. Yeah. Employers are taking really all of the risk and, uh, you get compensated for taking the risk because there are so many people who don't want to take the risk. Yep. So this plan, you know, they had each worked at different employment firms. They, so they got that everything experience. they needed to know. Yep. They got all the experience. They knew. See, that's the thing. They knew they could do it because they had been practicing exactly this law at a yeah. different firm. And they're just like, well, it's like me when I left PowerScore. Yep. You know, I taught for PowerScore for like a year and I got great teaching review after great teaching review after great teaching review. But PowerScore wouldn't pay me any more money. And then yep. it was like, well, OK, I'm going to go out and start my own thing then. Yeah. And that's exactly what these guys did. Yeah. It's a it's a great plan if you can pull it off. If you if you can get some experience, become an expert in a domain and then just go hang your own shingle. It's just not a thing that people do very successfully right out of law school. Mm-hmm. You're going to have to be in that law firm life for a while. Yep. Somebody else is going to get rich off of your work for a while. Then you can go out and start your own thing. Yep. And that I agree. That is a great route to a part time lawyer life. Sorsha, if you can do it. That said, I also know partners of small firms who work 70 hours a week. Yep. Trying to get that <laughs> that same level of pay. These folks found a good way to make money. It's not just the ownership of a firm. It's also ownership of a firm that's working in a place where there's money to be made. Yeah. And they also are choosing, by the way, you know, they're they're They've chosen. It sounds like to work 20. We want to work 20 hours a week and make 500 grand. They could maybe work 40 and make 2 million. Right. Or they could it's, work <laughs> 80 and make, you know, 750,000. I don't know. It's like it's real hard not to get caught up in that like continual no but i want more no but i want more mm-hmm. and to just like w- let work encompass everything um it's a choice everybody has to make i guess is like just how much is enough mm-hmm. and at those numbers of co- of course it's way more than your possible you know minimum needs but you want to send your kids to private school? Okay. Well, <laughs> that's get back be, to the office. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. No kidding. All right. Thank you, Sorsha. I appreciate that uh, follow up from 333. Yeah. 
That's the second mention of episode 333. Is it? We, uh, not in this recording, but in the last recording, <laughs> in the last episode, someone mentioned 333. So people are excited about the part-time job prospects, apparently. I guess, yeah. So this next email is from Matt, demon teacher Matt. He has been with us for a long time. You were the one who found Matt. Matt Dumont. Yep. He is a wonderful dude. Um, I wish Matt all of the best and don't have to wish it for for him because he's a guy who goes out and gets it. Yeah. So this is what he writes. Hi, Ben and Nathan. I wanted to express my sincere thanks to both of you for your huge parts in my journey. Last week, I accepted my first real law job for post JD. I'm going to be clerking on the Maryland Supreme Court, and I'm thrilled about it. I wouldn't have had this opportunity without both of you and your impact on my career. So thank you both for teaching me the LSAT. I love this test, and I love my job at the Demon because of it. Thank you, Nathan, for bringing me on as your TA slash operations dude in L.A., that made my transition to the demon possible. Yeah, Matt was with me as a TA and helped out with operations for my class in LA and San Francisco, both at the time and uh, <clears throat> was working for me part time when the pandemic hit. And when the pandemic hit, that's when Demon Live became a thing. And Matt started teaching uh, Zoom classes for us in the demon. Matt, by the way, took the LSAT five times and uh, Ended up with a full ride to Maryland. Yeah. Thank you both for taking a chance on me and letting me play in a Zoom classroom and teach for you. <laughs> he calls it play. Cool. Because it is. It's so fun. Uh, there's just nothing more fun. Thank you both for writing letters of recommendation for me, tearing apart my personal statement, and for all of your general and specific advice about going to law school. I'm going to graduate from law school in a year without a single penny of debt. Now that's going because to he got a full ride and because he worked his way through law school. Yeah, he did do both, right? Because you're going to have some expenses. Yep. And he also worked a few hours with us and was able to graduate without a penny of debt. Amazing. Yeah. I'm going to be in the top 10%. I'm going to have been on a journal. I'm already working for one Maryland Supreme Court judge. I'm going to have worked for the Maryland Attorney General's Office, Attorney General's Office this fall. And I will be going into a term clerkship with another Maryland Supreme Court judge. I drank the Kool-Aid you all are dishing out, and I am so happy I didn't pay for law school. I have had a great I've had great success at Maryland Law, and I am starting my career with a bang. Thank you both for your time, advice, and everything else. I wouldn't be where I am without it. My best, Matt. Thanks, Matt. I don't think I would be where I am without your help. And I know that hundreds of our demon students wouldn't be where they are without your teaching. So, um, no, you've helped, uh, us <laughs> in a million ways. That's amazing. Huh? Ben, he has his, uh, job already lined up before he even starts his three L year. Yeah. He's a rising three L. So he still has got the whole third year left to go and he knows where he's going to be working. He did well enough in his first year to get a good first summer gig, I guess. I can't. Do you remember what he did in his first summer? No. Nah. Other than working for us. <laughs> um, but yeah, so uh, he's <laughs> he's he's just killed it in every possible way yeah. and didn't pay for it at all. You know, this is a guy who could he could have gone to more higher ranking schools. Absolutely. He got in to higher ranking schools. But Maryland was his best full ride. And our advice is, dude, take the best full ride. You'll be a star there. And he is a star there. He's in the top 10%. And now he's going on to clerk for a Maryland Supreme Court judge. He's getting all of the best opportunities that that school had to offer yeah. because he's a scholarship kid at that school and he's killing it at that school. He still had to work his ass off. He still yeah. had to get the grades on the exams. But he was better equipped to totally kill it there. I think one of his other offers was UCLA. Mm. And, at, you know, UCLA wouldn't give him a full ride. 
And he could have gone to UCLA anyway, but then the level of competition at UCLA would have been a little bit higher. And, you know, Matt is a guy who's probably going to be successful no matter where he goes, but like getting A's on those law school exams at UCLA is just not, it's not that easy. I'm sure it's not easy at Maryland either, but (laughs) it's just Matt became a big fish in a slightly smaller pond and then just totally killed it there. Like he's thriving. He's going to get his salary paycheck and it's going to go to his life expenses, not to law school debt. (laughs) It's just like, it's, it's so rewarding, right? Like you don't make as much money when you start your career You make more as your career builds, but at least every dollar he's making is going to go to something that is of immediate value to him. Yeah. He's going to buy a house instead of buying a JD. Yeah. He he could have bought a JD, but instead he's like, no, I'll take a JD for free. Thank you. Now I'll kill it at your law school, get all the best opportunities your law school has to offer. And have my job lined up before I I have a full imagine how luxurious that is to just be like heading back to school for three L knowing you have flip flops on knowing (laughs) that you, you know, knowing that a full year in advance, you will have prepped for and taken the bar exam. And then you've got this job just sitting there waiting for you. 14, 15 months, whatever. Who knows how long? It's way down the road. Uh, amazing. Yeah. And not burdened with law school debt. Good job, Matt. You worked hard. We've seen it. Oh, yeah, for sure. Uh, be LSAT famous. Get on an upcoming show by emailing help at thinkinglsat.com. If you have questions about LSAT Demon, email help at lsatdemon.com and also check out our other podcast, LSAT Demon Daily. That was episode 359 of the Thinking LSAT podcast. Thanks all y'all for listening. Nice knowing you. Don't pay for law school. <laughs>